for questions. So if you have any burning questions, please interrupt me. Um, if it can wait later, and if we don't have time, you can talk to me just, just after the session. I, I can be there or just outside. One minute. Okay, so let's start. Uh, again, thanks everyone for joining me uh, in this talk today, both online and uh, physically. And the topic for the next 40 minutes is gonna be developing cloud native application with containerized database. I'm gonna be focusing on the developer experience and the tool sets that is required to do this kind of stuff with a more practical approach where I'll go through um, a demo of the, you know, let's say Kubernetes specific pipeline, right? And when I say Kubernetes, this is a talk about Kubernetes. Like I breathe Kubernetes every day. I've been working with it for about I don't know, six years, both on the CNI when I was working at Cisco and CSI more recently. I've joined a company called uh, OnDat where we provide distributed storage um, for Kubernetes. So, so sort of a hyper-converged environment for Kubernetes with additional capabilities like replication, encryption, all this kind of stuff. Um, but everything I'm trying to do is always with the developer in mind, in particular the DevOps tool set. So I'm not gonna be talking about how to build, you know, the best possible Docker images or using cosine, this kind of, you know, security is much more about the DevOps experience and the tool set that you can use without leaving Kubernetes. But first, let's define what is a cloud native application. Um, you know, quite often we heard, uh, we, we, we are hearing that cloud is just running stuff on someone else's computer. Uh, and if you do things like lift and shift, well, in the cloud, that doesn't necessarily mean that your application is cloud native. All right? So cloud native means a lot of different things, but mainly a cloud native application is an application that is aligned with the 12 factor apps. So I don't know if you guys are already familiar with this. Hopefully you are some sort of familiar with that. You have the link there. Um, and in the context of Kubernetes, there are a couple of you know, patterns or principles I want to highlight. Um, so cloud native application, you need to store the configuration in the environment. So you know, we all know bad practices. So how many developer in, in the room? Some, some of you are developers, right? So uh, bad practices in development is hard coding variables or anything you need, configuration environments as part of your code, right? So the idea of a cloud native application is to store configuration in the environment. And well, with Kubernetes, we have a lot of options to do so. There's config maps, there's secrets, etc. So the first thing to, you know, to, to, uh, to build, to, to do to build a cloud native application is to remove all the hard coded stuff from your existing app if you want to, or to build a new one and have this principle that is applied. And of course the configuration needs to be separate from, um, from the code. Then a second principle is to treat the backing services as attached resources, loosely coupled with your application or, or, or with your code. So that means that you should be able to swap um, quite easily, for example, if you want to talk to another database using another mailing service, another, you know, um, another bucket or another other external APIs, you should be able to, to be, you, you should be able to swap fast and without any consequences in your code, right? So your code should be uh, implementing the necessary abstractions to enable that. Then there is this principle which is about executing the app as one or more stateless processes. And this talk is also about integrating stateful applications, stateful components. 
And one of them, which just appeared um, earlier, was database. So effectively, a database is a state full components of the application, but here we are really talking about the expectation in terms of the application itself, which is um, if you do things like um, you know, caching for your sessions, this is not aligned as part of the application, not as part of an external or um, attached service. It's not part, or you're not, you're not aligned with the 12 factor apps patterns. This should be part of a external component. So it's really about the app itself, the core app should be stateless, running potentially as you know Kubernetes pods, Kubernetes deployments, this kind of things. But however, and this is where I want to go, um, database can be run in Kubernetes. We're gonna see how and what are you know, some of the be best practices to do so. But there are a couple of reasons to do it. First, well, it's co-located with your application. So in terms of latency, well, you're in some, inside the same cluster. So potentially same host or worst case scenario, same availability zone or potentially same region. And if you're in the same data center, maybe like a different rack, so super fast. The other reason may be that um, you want to leverage the, um, or you know, uh, leverage the um, embedded I mean, I would say the, the features of Kubernetes, things like resiliency, uh, the fact that it's completely distributed, so um, highly available, all of that are uh, features that are present natively in Kubernetes. So as soon as you put a workload in Kubernetes, you can also um, uh, reap the benefits of the same features. Another one which is really key is dev prod parity. And the idea here is to reduce the gap between dev and prod in terms of multiple angle, multiple layers. So first, people, where uh, for a cloud native application, you should have the same person that are, um, who are deploying the application in development and in production, right? This is basically the principle of DevOps. It's not like the operational team deploying in production and the dev deploying in, in the dev or staging environment. That should be the same uh, you know, set of people. Uh, then also a gap in terms of time. Uh, changing the code in, you know, as a developer in your development environment should, and then having a lag to production of several months, this is not how you build a cloud native application. This should be more in terms of hours and if you really want to go wild, it can be minutes with a continuous you know, deployment kind of pipeline. Uh, and then the last one is, of course, reducing the gap between the environment. And this is really related to the notion of shifting left. So I don't know if, has anyone heard about this term, shifting left? Yes, some of you. So the idea of shift left is to bring testing as close as possible um, to the early development stages. So it can be uh, test-driven uh, or uh, behavioral-driven uh, as well. Um, syntactic check as part of your pipeline very early, potentially involving QA in the design session, which may be hard, uh, but they may require a tool very early to test very early. So that may be part of the design as well. And um, a good benefit of Kubernetes is that you can build on the de facto characteristics of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes, the way I like to see it, is as a, uh, as a platform, of, of course, but where you can represent your infrastructure requirements as code, or should I say, as YAML, right? And then you can use technology like GitOps to even increase the level of security and to have better control to use Git as your single source of truth. And, um, but it, it, it is not limited to Kubernetes objects. So I, I mentioned, you know, I'm working for Ondat, which is a distributed storage company, and, but there are other open, open source solutions that provide this kind of features as well. And the idea is really to use the CSI driver. Remember, we're in the context of stateful workloads, right? Stateful workloads, their properties is really to persist data to disk, and what is important is that in case of a node failure, the, the data is not scratch. The problem is if you use like a traditional, you know, basic CSI driver in Kubernetes, you attach a PVC to your pod, um, if the node fails, well, there's no replication for your data. So of course, 
this is at the storage layer. You will have probably, if you're building an application or a database, let's say a stateful uh, component, you will have replication at the application level, right? You, you, like for example, MongoDB, you will have multiple replicas. So for sure, you can you know, base your high availability of, uh, based on that, but the reality is if a node fails and if you have more, or if, let's say if you have the three node MongoDB cluster, you lose one replica, one MongoDB replica, then you need to rebuild the new MongoDB database or well, the replica, you need to rebuild it, create a new pod that will be created, and then MongoDB has to resync the data, right? And this, depending on the database size, this can take, this can take hours. Um, and during that time, you're essentially running in a uh, degraded mode, right? So a better idea is to implement as part of the CSI, like you would do uh, in your you know, very expensive storage array. Right? Back in the days, you had synchronous replication, you had encryption, all those features for your most critical, mission critical application. And stateful application are mission critical. So the idea is to bring this into Kubernetes, um, this replication, this uh, encryption, but because Kubernetes has this notion of uh, infrastructure requirement as code embedded, the idea is for these extra features also represent them as YAML as code. You want to enable replication, it's just a label. You want to enable encryption, another label, right? That's the idea. And of course, if you want to shift left, it means, well, just using YAML for that. So as you de uh, you're developing the Kubernetes application on your local laptop, well, you can still use this YAML file. You can still have the software that is running in production in your local Kubernetes cluster, including in these TSI drivers, for example. And so once this is done, uh, once you have an idea of how to implement this, you, you have to define where you want to do it, right? So if we're not using Kubernetes, you can also use um, cloud native services, of course, to build a cloud native application, right? That's the principle. So if one moment we don't consider Kubernetes, uh, well, you can build things in Google Cloud, AWS, you can build things on-prem with your own tool set, but the reality is um, probably, I don't know if, your different companies are running workloads in depth. So who has, who is running workload in different clouds, today, different public clouds? A couple of, just one, some. So you are, for other people, it's just single cloud. So who is running workload in single cloud? Okay. Couple. No cloud at all? Still a couple. Okay, so the way I see it, talking to communities and users, is most of the time large companies uh, whether it's because of a merger, acquisition, or to use a specific feature, like if you are a Oracle customer, you probably better run Oracle database in OCI, right, in Oracle Cloud. Um, so what I see is more and more there is a multi-cloud strategy, not necessarily for high availability, but for you know, more tactical or strategical approach because of all those things that happen in your, in your enterprise and that you don't control. And uh, it means that in terms of skill sets, you have to learn, once you have learned how to do it in Google, and now you have to do it all over again in AWS, well, it's, you have to learn more stuff. So the idea is really to use Kubernetes as a standard or as a cloud agnostic operating system to build your cloud native application, regardless of the location. It can be on premises, can be in public cloud, it doesn't really matter. And the way I like to see Kubernetes, because it's this foundational layer, I would say it's equivalent to the modern GLIPC, right? Infrastructure requirements or application requirements that are common across the board. And yeah, that's basically it. But now in terms of the uh, stateful component, why, could, the, the real question is, can you really do it in, in, in Kubernetes? And what is the trend? So if you listen to Gardner by 2023, you will have 75% of all databases that will be migrated to a cloud platform. Uh, but it, it's both a mix of DB as a service, like RDS, and also using uh, Kubernetes to run databases because it's running in the cloud. But the big difference, trust me, will be cost. <laughs> if you use RDS, you will have tremendous cost in terms of you know, EBS provisioning, and in terms of availability as well, remember most of the cloud disks, they are 
uh, contain, the, the high availability is limited to uh, availability zone. If you need to recover across availability zone, there is downtime, you need to script something, you need to restore from snapshot, all of that, right? So you have to be careful. With Kubernetes and the right tool set, you don't have to do this. You can use local NVMe drives, even in your you know, instance, using your own instance store, as long as you have the right CSI drivers. Um, and you can have, basically you can build on your knowledge, which is Kubernetes, and spread it across all the cloud and build databases in the cloud. And here, this is an example of the most popular images, container images. The source is a Datadog that was late 2021. Um, so there are 14 of them, and most than half of them are stateful, anyway, right? And what is really enable us to run databases and other stateful components in Kubernetes, this is the operator pattern. So for those who are not familiar with the operator pattern, it is a way to encapsulate some knowledge into a Kubernetes controller and custom resource definition. So it's extending the Kubernetes API to represent anything as a Kubernetes first class citizen, including database, right? So you will find a lot of different databases operators that allows you to do things like build the database. Because if you deploy a stateful set, which is the Kubernetes native object to deploy stateful, um, stateful workloads, well, it just build the container. It does nothing on the app level. But how about if you want to build the MongoDB database automatically as the stateful set is scaling up and down, this is where the operator comes in. It will detect that the pods the number of pods are growing, and then it will increase the size of the cluster, do the replication, you can do backup, restore, uh, all these kind of things. It's encapsulated in um, the, the operator and represented in the end as YAML again. So we are back into our favorite um, <laughs> format, which is YAML. That's great, it's, it's a lot of hate in general with YAML, but again, this is YAML, it can be committed to Git, it can be uh, deployed via GitOps, uh, you can use policy as code with it, so it has all those benefits, right? So here are a couple of examples be before jumping into the demo. Um, here is a um, data services requirement, so I took on that as an example, but it's valid with open source one and any other CSI who support this feature. You can see here, this is just saying, I want two replicas, oh yeah, it's not, you can, yeah, it's two replicas, encryption is true, topology aware, which is this ability to detect multiple availability zone and spread your replicas across different availability zone to true. So it's as easy as this. So remember the shift left paradigm, you can already simulate all the production environment in your, uh, on your local laptop because all of this is available as software and defined as YAML. Same thing with policy requirement. This is an example of Kiverno, which I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have in, in, um, in the demo as well. So the idea of policy as code extended to uh, the operator pattern, for example, uh, for databases, is to say, imagine that in that particular case, this is, you, we require more than two replicas, so this is a two here, yeah, it's a bit light. Um, so that means that if the number of replicas that you have set in the previous um, YAML file is less than two, then you are, th there are different ways that Kiverno is implementing the control. It can be an admission controller. In that particular case, when you're gonna deploy that application in the cluster, this uh, stateful set is gonna be denied in the cluster, so it won't be deployed, or Kiverno, which is, I'm gonna show you, also has a command line that is taking as an input all those policies written as, as YAML, but not in Kubernetes, just YAML, taking this, matching against your uh, application manifest, and as part of a command line result, will tell you fail or pass, which means that you can include this into your global pipeline to uh, deny or accept a merge, for example, right? Before even deploying into the cluster, so that if you have a GitOps process in the end, can, can only be triggered if the different tests, including this, has passed. So you can do, it's like number of replicas, but imagine things like size of the database, which is another parameter of the custom resource for your database, you know, 
uh, for your database custom resource if you're using the database operator. Uh, things like sorry, things like permission. If you need to create a user with specific permission, you can also check it um, and validate it with a cluster policy using Caverno, everything in, in YAML. So of course there are other tools. You can use Opaget Keeper uh, if you want to learn Rego. <laughs> but this, this is Kubernetes. This is only using YAML. Uh, probably a bit less flexible than, uh, than Rego, but in, to my knowledge, 80% like of the use cases can be managed by using Caverno. And again, the idea is a couple of things. Checking this as early as possible in your dev environment and making sure that in, when you go to production, you have all the compliances, all your compli compliance rules that can be applied uh, into your the different application manifests. So I'm 25, that's 15 minutes left, so I have to go very fast now to explain the pipeline. So as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts, but we can divide it in two sections. The first one is the top line here from left to right. Uh, this is Sue, our developer. Uh, she is developing an application which is based on um, the Marvel API, storing Marvel requests into a MongoDB database. I'm sorry, I, I know the, um, the abstract mentioned SQL and the Zalando uh, uh, operator, but this is gonna, gonna be MongoDB with the community operator, but that's basically the, the same principle. So the idea is uh, to have uh, the application, a Flask application that is gonna perform requests um, to the Marvel API, store them into a MongoDB, and then the application will be displayed in the front end with sort of Marvel cards. So this is our application for today, which hopefully is better than a, just another Hello World sort of application. Um, and then for this, we're gonna use our laptop where we have a local K3S cluster running, which is common. Um, and what I want to do is to show you like a couple of tool sets. The first one is gonna be Scaffold. So Scaffold is a software from Google that allows you to uh, build, push, and manage the lifecycle of your application without committing anything to Git and to deploy it into your local Kubernetes cluster. You can store the images locally. It has policy-based image tagging. Um, yeah, as I said, you can choose to uh, keep the image local or to put them on the remote registry. Uh, in our case, they will be stored on, on Docker Hub anyway, but I, yeah, I just put it there. But I could have cho um, chosen just to, to, to keep it locally. And so scaffold embed a scaffold file that allows you to define, to express environment um, requirement using customize. So customize for people who don't know is basically a way to customize <laughs> your Kubernetes environment where you have a base of your Kubernetes manifest and then you can build different overlay that are gonna change the base with your specific requirements. So typically you don't use customize as a command line except when I'm gonna show you with, with the policy as code but it's supported by a scaffold locally on the laptop. We're gonna be using Tekton in production, which is a, a CI pipeline tool that is staying, that is living in Kubernetes, where every task is represented as a pod, right, as a container. And it's, of course, compatible with Customize, just you have a, another task that is gonna build the manifest using Customize. Uh, and so we have a novel for prod, we have a novel for dev, of course, as, as, I was, as I was mentioning before, we will have some uh, on that file, like YAML file to specify replication. Well, I'm just testing it in my local laptop, so I don't need any replication, don't need any encryption. And then it's gonna be, Scaffold is gonna manage all this part here from there to the end, including the deployment. As soon as, so as, soon as I change the code locally on the file system, when I save um, on my um, local file system, uh, scaffold is going to monitor uh, the folder, the directories, without committing to Git. It detects a flat file system change. It's going to push a new version of your application automatically uh, in your cluster, in your uh, development clusters, without committing the code to Git yet. And of course, once you're happy with the code, uh, you you do a pull request, and probably I'm, yeah, I'm just going to save it anyway. And once the pull request is is done, you can trigger your pipeline. There. And this is what we're gonna do with Tekton. So now it's, we are at the bottom, we want to do Tekton to deploy the, the application in production. So um, because we are now using Kubernetes, we don't want to use Docker 
of course, to build the image because you need to mount the Docker. I mean, now it's been deprecated anyway, but you don't want to, to mount the Docker socket in Kubernetes because you need root privileges, which is bad, right? So there's a, a great tool, again, from Google, which is called Kaniko, that allows you to build container images in Kubernetes without using uh, Docker at all, right? And without mounting any, uh, any containers, uh, the, the socket. And so that, that will be our first task in Tecton. So the, the role of Tecton is going to be to build, so the same thing as Scaffold, build the image, build uh, the application manifest using Customize. So our second task will be to use Customize uh, with Tecton to build a manifest, push the manifest on a uh, repository here. So uh, again, uh, build the image. Image is also um, uploaded to the registry. And the manifest use, using customize, we generate the file, push them to Git, and we will have Flux, which is a CD, so continuous delivery GitOps tool that will monitor that particular repository. And every time it's gonna see the modification in the manifest, it's gonna update uh, what is running in the cluster. So no kubectl to deploy the application. It's basically you have single source of truth and you have, this is the intent, and the intent is reconciled with the state that is in the cluster. And finally, I'm gonna show you Kuverno as part of a just manual action so that you can see how to validate or not if your manifests are uh, compliant. So I've got 10 minutes for this. This is gonna be challenging. <laughs> okay, so now let me uh, switch to the other environment. I need 15 minutes? Okay, still, great. <laughs> okay, so now, the cool stuff. Okay, so the idea, we're gonna start with scaffold. All right, so this is my application. I've got a lot of different things here, it's very small. Okay, this is my application there, all right? So on the left, you have um, the different components. So this is a Flask application, so template, page.html, this is where I've got my uh, front-end, let's say, code, where I'm just di displaying, uh, you know, the cards I want. So here, you, uh, I, I appears in comic. This is the part I want. Uh, um, I will want to change in just after to change it to comics with a with an S, just as modifying the code. Right? Let's go cheap <laughs> to modify the code. You see also the Docker file that is going to be used by. Um, by Kaniko, by Scaffold, by all the tools uh, to build the, um, the application container image. Uh, I'm using gunicorn as the web server, and I've got my main.p, my Python code that is basically um, connecting to the DB, and again, displaying some of the, or yeah, putting together some of the content, connecting to the database, and finally, Remember, I told you, when you deploy, you create an application in Kubernetes, you want to use um, Kubernetes native components to help you do this. So originally, the idea here is to start with an empty database, empty application, nothing is working, and I've got a Kubernetes job um, to basically, if you look at the job made on PY, is to realize the uh, the API request to the Marvel API and store them in the database to prepare the application. And the, one of the property of Kubernetes job is that it's gonna continue trying, I think by default it's up to 10 times, until it succeeds once. And you know, Kubernetes is mainly a highly asynchronous system with eventual converge convergence. This is the same idea here where it's gonna tr I'm gonna go deploy the application including the database, but the job will only succeed once the database has been uh, completely created and healthy, right? Um, then Python requirements. Um, so Docker file for, this is for, uh, yeah, it's the same thing actually. Yeah, it's not using that Docker file. So it's using that particular Docker file. It's the same thing. Defining some environment variable. And the main thing I wanted to show you is the scaffold, uh, uh, scaffold file, but meanwhile, I'm just gonna launch it because, so dev mode means that it's gonna monitor um, dynamically the file that you are modifying. So it's gonna be like a, um, a daemon sort of mode that is gonna build everything. So just to check here, this is my uh, 
uh, cluster, you can see I, I don't have I, I don't have like the dev namespace or anything, but it's going to appear as soon as uh, scaffold or is yeah it's creating stuff already. So it's preparing basically the environment for that. And you have the good thing is it also logs all the container that are part of the scaffold configuration. So you don't have to go into individual container to see what's happening. So back to our um, scaffold content. So again, it's YAML-like. <laughs> you define uh, what builder you want to use. So you can use Docker. I think I still have like the documentation open there. Scaffold, so for building, it supports um, Docker, uh, Maven, uh, custom scripts, build packs, a lot of different things, right? Here, I'm just using a custom script. Uh, I can show you the scripts quickly. It's because uh, I'm running on M1, which is an ARM processor, so I need to use Docker build X to cross compile on x86, right? These kind of things. But yeah, this is why it's, it's what I want to show you is that it's, you can extend, it's customizable. You don't have to use Docker, you can use custom script uh, as well, right? And then you can say uh, if it's uh, image local or here I'm just deploying, uh, creating and pushing the image on the um, uh, Docker registry, uh, registry. You just need to do, to have Docker running on your laptop, which I, I've got the, the case here. It's running Docker desktop here. Uh, and then customize and the path. This is the, the path to my uh, of dev overlay. This is all you need. And then you run scaffold there and uh, so now I think it should be ready. Let's, let's check. Yeah. Okay. Error. So la now we see error because the, the, um, the MongoDB database was not ready yet when the, j the first job has, <coughs> has, has run. So now we need to wait for um, this job here to be completed, and normally we should see, so you can see like here, you, you, that's the, um, the Kubernetes job error, the logs saying that, well, I cannot run because it's failing because I cannot connect to the database. It's not there yet, okay? So we're gonna wait. Normally it should take maybe another minute. Um, Media. So now it's, I'm just displaying uh, all the JSON payload that I'm uh, requesting from, uh, from the, um, the model API, which is about like 800 different entries. When it's done, I'm gonna show you what is the application and we're gonna change it. So it is there. Let's just do a port forward. Uh, it's running on port 8080. Okay. Now if we go localhost, Okay, so this is our application displaying some of the characters there. Uh, you can reload them. Uh -huh. You can also reload the whole page. So we're happy, but here there's a, there's a typo in, in comic. We want to put comics with an S. Well, now that's easy. The only thing I need to do for this, I go to my code. I'm just gonna look for all the comic iteration. So that's comic. And I want to replace with comix like this. Replace everything. I'm just gonna kill pour forward there and go back to my scaffold here. So I'm, I've replaced everything, right? Uh, just double checking that everything has been replaced. Comix there, everywhere. Now I'm gonna save just um, command S. And now it detected this is gonna build, not rebuild everything, just the front-end container uh, that is you know, um, coming from the, the code I've modified. So if I go back into my uh, environment here, you can see my DB is still there, right? If you see the DB didn't change, right? Still like four minutes. Just those three container, the front-end has been updated. And so now, if everything worked, um, I should go there and forward again and if I go back here just back you can see now the code has been modified I'm happy with this in production now I want to go in um, in dev I want to go into production so this is the cluster this is the other cluster I've got nothing running it will be in the default namespace and I'm going to be using Tecton this time to deploy into production 
So for this, let's go um, first, we're gonna kill everything here. And when you're done with um, scaffold, just press Control C, it's gonna delete all the component for you, right? And you're back to a, um, to a you know, uh, healthy and minimalist cluster, deleting your, without your application. So now for Tekton, uh, let's first, I, want, I wanted to show you um, customize. I've got like five minutes to collect. <laughs> okay, let's be quick. Um, customize, which is um, there. So you have the base here that is defining uh, all the, the job, the, the deployment for my, um, the Kubernetes deployment that's re representing uh, the wrapper around my container, the service, um, to deliver my front end, and this is my database uh, custom resource where I can define the size, which is one, uh, one gig, etc., etc. This is the base, and this is the overlay where I'm going to apply different qualities. So here, for example, in the dev overlay, I've got replicas, zero encryption, false. So now let's check to check out uh, master. Okay. And you can see that now I've got prod there. And uh, here, replicas, encryption, um, my, uh, in terms of my CRD for um, my database, uh, I've got two volumes, one gig, I've got a user with permission. All of that is just representing my environment for production. And now Tekton is gonna use um, Customize to, uh, to build the production um, application. So now Tekton, so just to put it like very quickly, Tekton will run all the tasks. So building the image um, and from one task to another, you can also share information in the form of config maps, secrets or storage and PVCs. Um, if you want to use more than one, then you have to have a solution that um, eliminate the requirement to run a pod and the volume on the same node which on that can do and others as well, but by default, you won't be able to do that. Uh, so this is a way to optimize Tekton as well using the right CSI. So for Tekton, again, same thing. What we're gonna do is like everything in Kubernetes to trigger the pipeline, we can, we can create, just uh, push the manifest into Kubernetes. Just by doing this is gonna trigger the whole pipeline that we can monitor using a Tekton command line. Here is gonna run, um, monitor the whole pipeline. And same thing as scaffold, but now except that it's gonna be in production. And um, I'm gonna also monitor things with Flux. So Flux is monitoring at the end of the Tekton pipeline. What I'm doing is remember using customize, build the manifest, push the manifest to a particular repository. Tekton is gonna pick it up, uh, sorry. Flux is gonna pick it up. Here you, you're gonna see one line that is basically saying, I'm reconciling the state of the cluster with the intent that is residing in my Git repository. And in no time, we should see here, so you can see here, this is the different, uh, this is the, 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 the pipeline running in Kubernetes. So again, this Tekton software is basically using Kubernetes to run the pipeline itself. So you can run it in a different cluster, probably not your production cluster, maybe your staging cluster or your DevOps cluster, but it allows you to consume Kubernetes even, I mean, also to build your pipelines, which is, I think, a great idea if you want to do everything into Kubernetes. Again, you don't have to use cloud-specific tools on AWS and code pipelines, all that. You can keep everything into Kubernetes. So now we are, it's, it's done one task, for every task, you will see a new pod that is gonna pop up. Okay, so in the meantime, while it, probably like another two minutes, which will be the end. So if there is any question, you can shoot them now. I know that was a lot, but hopefully that was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now it's slow. <laughs> so I'll go quieter now. Uh, so my question was to extend on the example that you showed, the change to your, uh, I think it was a web app, uh, you changed some text, which rebuilt just the specific portion 
uh, that you changed. I'm gonna give another example, like let's say you changed your, uh, made a change to your database model with the same effect that it would only change to the, the database structure as well. Yeah, so um, no, it will, so Scaffold will just monitor uh, the, 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 the directory that you set up in terms of um, uh, what is deployed in Kubernetes, right? So basically if you change something that is not in that directory and that doesn't affect Kubernetes, it won't redeploy anything. So it means that the only thing it will be able to redeploy for the database is that if you change the custom resource for the database, not like the model itself or something that is deeper, more than infrastructure requirements. One more question if I could, uh, just real quick. For the deployment uh, of this, um, could this be done locally as well? Uh, so you, you mentioned running it on your local uh, laptop. This will work there as also, and it can be extended to on-premise Kubernetes deployments and so forth? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just to finish, you can see that it's been reconciled, and you can see that on my um, Git, um, GitHub repository, now the manifest has been populated by the pipeline. So all the manifest done by Customize, populating like the new image with the new uh, digest, all the policy that you have set, everything is there. And um, yeah, um, Flux has just picked this up and just, we're gonna, the application is there just to show you that the application is working now. If I go back into here and um, let, so the pipeline is finished. Like again, you have all the logs and if I do pull forward, this time in production in my cluster, I should see that once again, yeah, it has picked up, of course, the changes from the code, and now it's running in production, right? Uh, if we have maybe time, is, is there any other questions? Maybe one, okay, if not, maybe online, there's no question. Okay, perfect, so just to finish, <laughs> um, this is what we have been talking about today, as a sum up, what, what, what is this? <laughs> Sorry for that. Last slide, okay. So takeaway for today, uh, stateful workloads in Kubernetes are possible if you deploying or if you want to create a cloud native application, you can collocate your stateful component with the stateless components as long as you provide the right uh, additional data services like replication, encryption, mobility. My company, of course, provide this, but this is not the only solution. You have a lot of open source solution. Um, Kubernetes is great to use it as a cloud operating system, as a standard across all different clouds, but of course it has a learning curve. But once you learn Kubernetes, it's just enough to deploy your application and create your application anywhere. And finally, um, there is a lot of ecosystem tools right now that run in Kubernetes. I've shown you Tekton, I've shown you uh, Scaffold. So the developer experience is getting better, better, and better and better every day. So don't hesitate to uh, check them out. If you want to get linked to the repo um, that I've used, I can post them. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I've put it in the presentation first, in the first slide. Uh, you can just contact me and I can try to find a way also to post it somewhere uh, that you can access. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully it was a cool demo. Thank you.